Father, we thank you for the many healings. We thank you for deliverance. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for healing our bodies. We thank you for the gift of answered prayers. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. This morning, take all the glory that belongs to you. May man not be seen in the name of Jesus. And when this gathering is over, we will go home shining like glory. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Welcome your neighbor. Smile at your neighbor. Say, welcome to church. So welcome to our reign, where we are trained to reign. Glory to Jesus. All right, started the topic on healed, health, and healing last week. So I'm going to take you further in God's word today. Third John verse two, in just one chapter. Third John verse two. I hope you still remember all I taught you last week. Okay, I mentioned Rafa and. Who can tell me the three meanings of Rafa? Is God my what? God my physician. That is the one that prescribes to you. So that office is the prophetic office of Rafa. Say it's the prophetic office of Rafa. Good. Number two. God my what? God. I would like you to talk if we're in church. Please open your mouth. God my what? Is God my immunity? All right. So he's the one that keeps you from disease or keeps disease away from you. Now the last part is God my what? God my what? God my healing. God my healing. So he's the one that heals you. He's the healing power that heals you. Are you following me? So today, let's just go further. I know I have a word from God. I taught you about what happened in in the wilderness on their journey you remember how that the serpent came we explained the serpent we explained what happened in that text so today we'll go further read for me everyone beloved i pray that you may prosper in all things again read it again one to go All right, so John was praying for his church. And he said that I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health. Say, I am in health. Say, I'll be in health. In the name of Jesus. I am in health. I'll be in health. Because the word says so. Good. So he says, I desire that you prosper. Now, whatever his prayer is or his wish is in this text, is clear. He says, I desire that you prosper and be in health. So if this man of God prayed, it, prayed this prayer for his church, then you understand that this is the will of God. The old version will say, I, I, wish, that you, I wish that you be in health. I wish that you prosper and be in health. Now, God's will, God's wish is God's will. God's wish is a revelation of his will. God's wish is a revelation of his will. So if the word says that um, I want you to prosper and be in health, and this verse makes it or made it into the Bible, it means that it is the will of God that I am in health. It is the will of God that I am in health. I don't understand to define what health is, but it's perfect well-being, holistic well-being in every area of your life. It desires that you are in health. However, we won't talk about the little part today. It says this experience is directly proportional to the prosperity of your soul. Did you say that? It says you will be in health just as your soul prospers. As your soul prospers. So if your soul is not prospering, it is likely that you will not be in what? In health. So the state of health is the state where you are not needing healing. Everything that needs to be healed has been healed. You do hear me? The state of health is not a point where you are needing healing. It means the position, that point where everything that needs to be healed has been healed. 
in the area of healing you don't go to god asking god what his will he is in the place of prayer so lord do you want to heal me when jesus was on earth when he walked the hell in the earth he would say that i do what i see my father do am i right he says that a lot he said whatever i do is what i see my father do now you look at jesus you saw him healing everywhere actually healing makes about um, 80 percent of jesus's ministry healing actually makes about 80 percent of it he actually healed more than he taught it doesn't mean he should teach less but the truth is that he healed more than he taught if you count all the sermons Jesus preached in the Bible, it's not as much as the healing he wrote in the Bible. So Jesus now says to you that every healing you saw was the will of the Father. Jesus now says to you, every time I healed, it was because I saw my Father healing that person. So I was just the extension of his hand. I am the manifestation of his will. So if you are the kind of believer that is troubled, you're sick in your body and you're thinking, does God really want me to heal? No, today you have come to light. Say, I have come to light. Because the revelation of God is seen in Jesus. Our father asks, when you read the book of Deuteronomy, and I began to look at questions, you know, we took questions Wednesday, Zoom meeting. We hope you learn to join the Zoom meeting on Wednesdays. I do Bible study. You ask all kinds of questions. Now, I'm a teacher, I'm not just a prophet, so follow me carefully. Mm -hmm. Where is the Bible study? When we began to list questions on why people, questions people have about healing, or myths they hold about healing. One of it is whether God wants to heal, another is whether sickness is a disease or is a curse from God, and all of that. If you read the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 1 to 14, you will see blessings and curses. And one of those curses was sickness. Are you following me? So sickness passed as a curse from God. However, I taught you the root of sickness last week and I told you that it's from the sin of Adam. Praise God. Good. But sickness is a curse. So how would a believer who has believed in the death, resurrection, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus now looks at sickness that is a curse and says that God put this curse on me or on him? Jesus died to redeem us from the curse of the law. Take note. Jesus did not destroy the curse of the law. Praise God. If Jesus destroyed the curse of the law, then no one would fall sick. Jesus did not destroy the curse of the law. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Jesus did not abolish the law. He fulfilled the law and he fulfilled the terms of justice of the law. So justice, the law demanded death. He gave the law death. Are you following me? He fulfilled the law by that. When we say he fulfilled the law, read everything written about him in the law. He came as, they say, as the law says he will come. He died as prophecy says he will die. Are you following me? He fulfilled the law and he met the terms of justice of the law. And one of the outcome of meeting the terms of justice of the law is the fact that the one that now believes in him is redeemed from the curse of the law. And one of it is sickness. You don't believe me? Galatians 3.13, Galatians 4.5, they are my proofs. I don't, want to, I don't have time to read it. Just take note of them. It redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Because it became curse on the tree. So, the next question I would like to ask you is this. How will God put a curse on whom he died for? What am I saying? It cost God the life of his son to take away a curse. Then after it cost him the life of his son to take away a curse, he then comes back again and put the same curse on you. Who has believed in his son? No. I wrote in my note, God will not put what it cost the life of his son to take away on you again. You didn't hear me. 
God will not put what it cost the life of his son to take away. He won't put that on you again. You know why I'm trying to establish that? I'm saying that because you need to get to a point where you understand that when sickness comes to your body, there are different reasons why people fall sick. Not always spiritual. Praise God. All right. But when sickness persists, praise God. When sickness persists and there is no medical explanation or all medical, um, all medical, what do you call it? All medical mode or method has been applied and nothing is living, then you understand that this is not what? Natural. Praise God. It can be a curse of the law. It can be a demonic activity. Whatever it is, you must understand that God is not in the middle of it. Because the moment you think God is in the middle of it, you, you lose the ability to act. Did you get what I'm saying? The moment you think God is in the middle of it, you lose the ability. To, how do you do it? You call on God to fight God. Do you do that? God puts something on you, then you go to God and say, God, come and remove what you put on me. So, the, the, your mind must first be delivered from the notion that it could be from God. It's never from God. That is why you see many believers go to the place of prayer for, their, for whatever sickness they may be experiencing or their loved one may be experiencing and they will start begging God for what the devil has done. Are you getting what I'm saying? However, one of the reasons people still fall sick today is because the law is active. The law is still active to the man that is under the law. And when we say under the law, it, it does not mean that, uh, when we say under the law, we are saying that the dominion of sin that the law produces has been broken over you. It means you are no more slave to sin and its curses. That's what it means. So people still fall sick today because the law is still active. Are you following me? Is that easy to get? What did I say? Re-echo me, please. And that is what the accuser uses. The accuser uses the law. The law is not dead. It's just that some of us have been delivered from it. Some of us have been redeemed from it. Some of us, that law does not have dominion over us. When I mean some of us, I mean those who have received Jesus. Praise God. So today you say find the accuser and the prosecutor of the bedroom. You know, it's not just the accuser, it's also the prosecutor. You know, there's one between an accuser and a prosecutor. Uh huh. We say I have him going around using the law on people. Even those who have been delivered from the law. Hallelujah. So, when I see sickness in my body, the first thing I must do to be healed is that I must, I must exonerate God. The truth is that, is it, I'm going to show you some revelation. I can't, maybe I'll touch on healing tomorrow, next week again, then I'll go to the team for next, next um, month, August. I was teaching on sacrifice in August. But maybe I'll teach, I'll still touch on healing next week. The truth is that, is it possible for God to put sickness on a man or to put death to a man, on a man? Yes, it's possible. But if it's possible, the purpose is for God. The purpose is to deliver him. Now, that, that's that easy for some people now. Follow me carefully. Listen to me again. Is it possible for God to put sickness or disease or death on a man? Is it possible at all? It is possible. I've seen it happen prophetically. I've seen times when I want to pray for somebody and the Lord said, don't touch him. Let him die. Now, follow the system. Follow the system, actually. I've taught you this principle. The system is that God will not inject sickness or disease or death to him. Mm -mm. Are you following me? In that case, the will of God might be for him to go home. Yes. But the, when in time, it is the will of God for a man to go home. God is trying to save the man or deliver the man. However, the way God puts that on him will not still be... Uh, God is so good in a way that it will, something will be on you. It will be looking at it. But you can't pin it on God. Do you get it? 
Let me give an example. It's like I want to excommunicate a worker in church. Now, but I have to use the code of conduct for church workers or for, or for church leaders. Are you following me? I have to use the code of conduct. So I don't do anything. But because you are a man, in my place they say you cannot walk and your head will not shake. <laughs> Avi, do you understand the proverb? Right? So, but there's a principle that must make you to be punished. It's the law of sin first that will make you to be punished. Are you getting what I'm saying? So until a man now, sin now works. So when sin works, the man gives room for what? For death. I read James to you last week. He says, when anyway, there is sin, there is what? Death. When sin is lost, is conceived, it becomes sin. When sin is con- conceived, it brings forth what? Death. So when that happens, in that chain reaction, God will, withdraw, God will withdraw deliverance from the man. Are you following it? So instead of calling Bola, say, Bola, hmm, this thing you are doing, the next step is excommunication. I will just leave her there and say, your excommunication plan has been written. Signed and seen. Continue. Are you following the picture? Uh-huh. There are more than one Bola in church. Praise God. Are you getting what I'm saying? Then the reaction continues and it leads to the head. Because at that point, God feels that death is better than life for him. I'll give you an example in scripture. Ezekiah. Look at Ezekiah. In scripture, Ezekiah was going to die. Ezekiah ran to God and said, God, kill me not. And it brought forth a strong reason. He laid it on the altar. I gave, I did this, I sold it, I sacrificed, I did this. And after that, because those things he brought to the, to, to the altar... Or to that discussion, there were principles that cannot be what ignored. God works with principle. You God cannot ignore his seeds, God cannot ignore his sacrifices, God cannot ignore his prayers. So he brought said, God, see, see, death, I won't die. And God said, No problem. And God withdrew death. Are you following me? So God delivered him from death. God rebuked death. They are dead. Stop. Get out. Are you following me? But the question is, was it God that sent death? It will contradict scripture. It couldn't have been God. The activities that brought death in the first place couldn't have been God. It could have been Ezekiah's action. Are you following me? When the prophet came to Ezekiah to say, Ezekiah, you're going to die. It was, just, it was the prophet announcing to Ezekiah the effect of an action or a reaction he started. Are you getting the priest? Are you getting the picture? So God stepped in and said, Ezekiah. Ezekiah stepped in and said, God, I won't die. And God withdrew it. But why did God intercept death in the first place? Sending his prophet to say, Ezekiah, pray, pray. Are you getting my point? Sometimes people will call me and say, I, was, I saw this about it. I said, don't worry. I went from nation to nation and kingdom to kingdom. He suffered no man to do me wrong. He rebuked him on my behalf. God has sent men to tell me different kinds of prophecy. What is God doing? I believe God is intercepting death or evil for me for one reason. Because he still wants me alive. But when it gets to a point when God does not speak to men about life or death for you, it means at that point God has said, I've given up on this one. Let him come home. It's better for him to come home. Now, until you look at the end of the story of Ezekiah, you won't understand why God did what he did in the first place. In the end, Ezekiah went into idolatry. He backslid it. And I hope, maybe we never or not, we don't know. Because we don't know what happened on the deathbed. But most likely, he went out of the will of God. So why did God want him to go home? Why did God want that reaction of death to continue and get to the end? It was to preserve Ezekiah. Did you get what I just thought? Is it complex? You have to preserve Ezekiah. You have to preserve Ezekiah. But Ezekiah said, no, I know the principle. I know the principle. I know how to challenge God. He did. I get in the picture. Those are the only times when it looks like so anytime I say, and the Lord said, leave this one, let him come home, I understand what God is doing. God is preserving the person. Because what we call death to God is relocation. Hallelujah. Are you following me? So God is not the one that puts sickness on a man. Say, so God is not the one that puts sickness on a man. He's not. He's not. It's either a man puts sickness on himself or the law of sin and death puts sickness on him. 
Is it possible for a man to put single on himself? Very well, yes. Very well, yes. Very well, yes. Very well, yes. When we say that, we are saying that it was the man's action that created it. The woman that looked at, that, that laughed at David when she was dancing in the temple, when she was dark, dancing what we call naked in the temple. And the Bible said the Lord shot her womb. Who shot her womb? She shot her womb with herself. How did, how did I say they shot her womb? It was her action that um, caused that reaction. It was her seed that gave birth to what? An harvest. You must understand the principle. A professor, a professor to a woman during BCC. You know, the way the Lord reveals things. She came to me before, and they came to me and told me about prayer, pray for them to have children and all of that. I prayed for them. I prayed, and I said, okay, the Lord did not say anything to me, but I'll, I'll pray. So I prayed. I prayed. But the other said, I know Bishop has a word for us. So he kept coming. I prayed again the second time. I said, the Lord has not said anything. I prayed. So while praying, what did I do? I just stayed on the word. God wants you to be fruitful. So I prayed, you'll be fruitful. Don't worry. You'll be fine. So I told them to also continue praying. I've always thought that the end goal of prayer is what? First is what? Revelation. Instruction. Now, the couple had, the couple had named different kinds of people as a cause of their problem. Including mother-in-law. I'm telling you the truth. They, have, they are named different kinds of people because of the problem. They are pastors. But suddenly, as I was minister at BCC, I noticed that she was the one that shot her own womb. Who remembers the prophecy? Good. I said, the angel of God shot your womb because you indact the work of God. And that was our deliverance. Because now she knew what to repent of. Then I gave her further instructions. So when sickness or death is at work in a man, it's not God. It's either the devil, using the law of sin and death, or you. Or a man. Let's add that to it. Or another man. Do you know I can make you sick? Praise God. You don't know? You too can make people sick with the instrument of your words. Am I right? Good. Your own may not happen, but my own will happen. Because my words don't fall to the ground. By the way, this week I received so many testimonies in Irene. Hallelujah. Praise God. It was really the week of pleasant surprises. Hallelujah. Let me close with this. I want to do a Bible study on the first account of healing in the Bible. That's why I'm closing. It's still a long journey, but that's the, that's the next body. The first healing in the Bible. Let's do a Bible study on it. When I say I'm closing with this, hallelujah. Another thing will just come up. I'm closing with this. I hope you're getting blessed by my teaching. All right. It's a rush work, so just permit me. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 20, the Bible spoke of Abraham. The Bible said he journeyed from there to the south and dwelt in Kadesh and Shaw and stayed in what? Geha or Gera. So this was Abraham and his wife, Sarah or Sarah. They traveled to this city, and the name of the king in this city was Abimelech. Let me back up. Understand the principle of first mention in the Bible. Anytime something is mentioned first, it means the found, that is the foundation of that teaching, of that experience. It means that you can use what has been taught in that first mentioning, you can use it to build an experience from the beginning of the Bible to the end. You can pick all the principles you found in the first mentioning and begin to look for it in Exodus, in, in the prophet, in the law, 
in the Gospels and in the Epistles. Are you following me? The principle of first mentioning is one of the major principles of Bible interpretation. So to understand healing, let's look at first mentioning. So let's go ahead. So they got there, and um, the background of the story is that uh, Sarah was like a model. Like a model, she was very fine. Praise God. Tall. Cook and Fanta. Beautiful. Praise God. Mm -hmm. If I say fair now, they say Papa likes fair women. If I say black, they say Papa. So who come for that? He was both. But she was tall. That one there, you cannot compromise it. She was tall. Praise God. Have you seen Sarah before? Me, I saw her. <laughs> I'm joking. So, because of our look, her husband was scared for her and for himself. Because those days, kings take wives. They see you walking with your wife and say, I want her. That's dominion. Yeah. Glory. That's how to reign. Vekina Bahashtahaya. Say, I reign in life. I know I shame you. Don't reign anyhow. <laughs> you want to reign, reign to your own direction. If you reign to my direction, <laughs> If you reign to my direction, I will show you power. <laughs> God never, never. Ah, if they turn again. <laughs> like, yeah. Even my that is not married, he's saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you reign to my friend. <laughs> hmm, that's what he's saying in his spirit. He said, if you reign to my friend, that lady I'm looking at, if you reign to her side, I will show you that you reign in another direction. <laughs> Praise God. So that was, a, that was the case with Abraham. And kings then, they just took wives. So Abraham decided to lie. Is it good to lie? Is it good to lie? Is it a sin to lie? Is it a sin to lie? Some of you are so used to lying that you said no. How about? I know you used to. How much did you buy the material? Oh, it's 4,005 in the market now. I just spoke to the supplier now. And you know it's 3,500, but you want to make profits. <laughs> okay. So Abraham was afraid that the king would just take his wife. So Abraham told this, the wife, he said, You are going to lie. You are going to lie that you are not my wife, that you are my sister, or whatever. So they did that. And Abraham lied. Now, read the whole story in Genesis 20. In, so, Abimelech took the wife, took his wife. Now, Abimelech was not that kind of king, but when you look at the background of the whole story, Abimelech was saying that, if you had told me your wife, I'm not that kind of king that takes another person's wife, I would have just let go. But it was because you said, it's your sister, that was why I asked her, I said, your sister, so that's why I went ahead. The man was like, oh, am I sure? <laughs> Are you following that picture? So God appeared to Abimelech in the dream. And God told Abimelech, you have taken the wife of a prophet. Hiya. You have taken what belongs to a prophet. It's good to be a prophet, though. <laughs> you have taken what belongs to a prophet. You are a dead man. A dead man. Abimelech woke up from the dream. He remembered the dream. And he was scared. So what did Abimelech do? Called Abraham, returned his wife. Are you following? You know when Abimelech met Abraham and said, "Why did you lie to me?" Abraham said, "Abraham, said, I didn't really lie to you, because she was my sister before I married her." Like, so I was speaking from the past. That's what she said. You don't believe me? Go to verse. Verse 10, 11. Run from verse 11. And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of the Lord is not in this place, and they will kill me on the account of my wife. Next verse 12. But indeed, she is truly my sister. And actually, they were cousins and sisters like that. She is the daughter of my father, 
or half sister rather, right? Daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became. So the time you were lying, what was she? Wife. But the liar is a liar. He said, but she's my sister. So I didn't really lie. You know that kind of thing. Where are you? I'm at home. But we are, in, we are not at home in the house. No, I'm on my street. See, I'm not. I'm just in front of my street. Why did you come for a hazard? I was having a headache. So I went to take medicine at the pharmacy. But you are in your house. And I'm still taking Panadol. You see the same thing. <laughs> So we are, there are many Abrahams. People are like Abraham here in church. So there's nothing strange about Abraham. But that's not where I'm going. Follow me carefully. Verse 13. And it came to pass that God caused me to wander from my father's house. Okay? That's not where I'm going. Verse um, 17. Run to verse 17. Verse 17. So God, so Abraham prayed to God and God did what? Funny enough, this is the first mention the word healed was used in your Bible. You can note it down. The first time healed was used in the Bible. First time. The first time, Abraham prayed to God and there was a healing miracle. And God healed Abimelech. Not just Abimelech. God healed his wife. God healed his female servant and the boy children. You now find out that the first manifestation of healing in the Bible was healing of the womb. Are you following me? The Bible said, they bore. So it means that, Caliph Rana Jesus, listen carefully to me. It means that barrenness was so much in Abimelech's household that it was not his wife alone that was barren. Even servants were barren. It means that when a curse is on the household, it doesn't stay on the man alone. It comes on everybody in the house. And when the blessing is also on the household, it doesn't stay on the man alone. It comes on everybody in the house. Are you following me? And the Bible says, Abraham prayed to God. And God healed Abimelech. Now, this is the beautiful part. But this is, we need to look at what happened. How, what are the principles we can look at in these texts that can make us or help us walk in healing in the future? Let's list some things. Number one. You need to write them. God walks through people. He heals through people. The moment Abraham, Abimelech returned um, his wife, why didn't God heal him by himself and say from heaven? God just speak from heaven and say, Abimelech, now you are hereby healed. No. God see you a what? God see you a what? It means that that healing you are waiting for, God will likely use a man. God will use a man. Number one. So God's healing is communicated through men. Men may lay hands on vessel or anything. They may give instruction, but it's still communicated through men. Number two, follow me. God uses men, but he also uses flawed men or flawed people. This is the most interesting part of the whole incident. Look at the case. Abimelech was not at fault. Abraham was at fault. Abraham lied. Abraham was dishonest. And there was no case where Bible says, and Abraham went back to, down before God and repented. After repenting, then he went to heal Abimelech. Did you notice that? Not, nothing like that in the story. Abraham was, Abraham just lied. I don't want to say it wasn't seen, but he just lied. And God see used Abraham to heal Abimelech. This shows that healing power is not manifested by our ability to run away from sin. Mm. The prerequisite for to operate in healing is not by your avoidance of sin. Never. Because there is something greater than heat. It is grace. It covers and hinders sin. Now, next is that. If you look at the case of Abraham, because I like to teach step by step, clearly, didactic. If you look at Abraham, 
the next thing you should ask me if you're a Bible student is that, but sir, the covenant of grace was not yet fully established at the time. Am I right? So how could it be that it was the covenant of grace that was at work that made Abraham healed Abimelech's family despite his sin? Your question will be right. But before that time, follow me carefully, God had an encounter with Abraham. And God said to Abraham, I will bless those you bless. And I will curse those you curse. So, remember that covenant comes with terms and what? Conditions. However, the term and condition of that covenant did not include Abraham's behavior. Lying was not one of it. So despite the sin of lying, Abraham could still bless and could still heal. Because when God says, I will bless the one that blesses, it's what is included in that text is also that when you bless a man, the person is what? Is blessed. So Abimelech returned, his wife. That was a blessing to Abraham. In that text, Abimelech was blessed. Abraham looked at the man and Abraham blessed him with the gift of healing for his family and the man was healed. Despite the fact that Abraham lied and he was in sin. But the truth is that covenant, when enacted, is greater than anything. The only hindrance to a covenant is when the terms and condition of the covenant is broken. Are you following what I'm saying? So I tell people, I say, whether I pray or I don't pray, I see. You know why? It's a covenant. I hear. You know why? It's a covenant. The only thing that will hinder that is the term and condition of the covenant. And I won't tell you the term and condition. Unless you become the Delilah that will come and cut off my hair. Praise God. Did you get what I'm saying? So despite Abraham's sin, Abraham could still heal. Not because sin cannot hinder the flow of power. Sin can. But the covenant in that area, the covenant that made that happen, was the covenant God made with him. It had a condition. And it was not, one of the conditions was not, or moral behavior was not any of the conditions. First principle. Number two, or number three now. There are times where the person that is ministered healing may need a miracle, may also need healing. The fact that I'm sick does not hinder me from ministering healing. Abraham was waiting on the Lord for a child. Few chapters before that time. Abraham has, he had a conversation with God. I said, God, what's up now? You see, you are telling me about covenant. Can't you see that I don't have children? Abraham was waiting to have a child. Sarah's womb was not fruitful. Abraham had not ministered healing to his wife. Abraham was healing, ministry healing to another person's wife and housemaid. So the fact that the man that wants to minister healing is sick is not an hindrance to healing power. Funny enough, let me tell you the truth. Many healing ministers, we find it hard to heal ourselves because we are so familiar with the power. But when it comes to people, it's easy to dispense power. You know, look at me. It's easy to say, watch me, watch it, watch this, don't lose me. It's easy to say, take. It's harder to say, take. You know what I'm saying? It's easy to say take because you have two hands to, to receive it. If I say take, I have to use the other hand to receive it. So it's easier for you to take than for me to take. So the fact that a man is sick or a believer is sick does not mean he can't even, you Don't say, ah, I'm sick. I can't minister healing to anybody. Let God heal me first. No error. You can. It's never... And hindrance. And don't deny people of healing that is in your hand as a believer. I told every believer can heal the sick. 
because you feel you are inadequate or because you feel that you are still seeking your body no or you're still praying for healing in one particular area no 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 praise god number four in that text is that there are many times healing is instant healing may be instant though the physical evidence may not may come later Healing may be instant. The physical evidence may come later. Healing may be instant. The physical evidence may come later. You know why? Abraham prayed. The Bible says, he prayed to heal them. And after he prayed to heal them, what did you see? The Bible did not tell us, and they got pregnant. Or an atomy shot out, out, or shot out right there. Yeah. But the Bible said they were healed. They knew they were healed later. They had their babies later. So you don't disapprove healing because you don't say healing has not been done because the manifestation is not instant. There are times manifestation is instant and there are times manifestation may come later. Now the problem with the Christian is that even when, manif- even when healing has happened and the manifestation and it's instant and we are waiting for future manifestation, the problem with many Christians is that they now undo healing with their own words. They now undo healing with their own mind, with their own perspective. They now begin to say, after all, I was not healed. After all, I'm not healed. Even when healing has been wrought. Praise Jesus. Are you following me? The last part for me there is that Abraham made power available for healing. Who prayed? Was it God? Was it God? Was it Abimelech? Who prayed? Abraham. Abraham made power available for healing. So if you are going to heal the sick, you must make power available for what? For healing. James 5, can I have it? James 5, verse 16. I want you to read this together. One, two, go. Confess. Hold it. Are you ready now? Let's do it. Amplified Bible. Confess to one another. Therefore, your fault. Read the last part and read it loud, please. Hold on. The NS. If you have eye problem, I will heal you in this service. If you do, if you cannot see far. In case you cannot see for today, I'm going to heal you. It was Abraham that prayed. I will be the one that will pray. And I pray God will heal you. Huh? So read now. Be healed. He- read the harness. One more time, please. One more time. The harness. Praise God. The earnest heartfelt prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. When God will heal someone through you, God will heal the person through you, yes, but he will not use his power. He will use his power that you have made available. God will use his power that you have made available. The NX heartfelt prayer of uh, the righteous man makes tremendous power available. So the principle is that power, prayer, makes power what? Available. Well, listen to me. If you come to my office or to my house and they say, Bishop is not available. Does it mean Bishop is not alive? Talk to me. Does it mean Bishop is not alive? 
Does it mean I've I'm, I'm gone to heaven? It means I'm not right there for use or to attend to you. So when we say the annex prayer of the righteous man makes power available, it doesn't mean there is no power. It just means the power is there, but power is not available for use. So when the believer receives Jesus, he has received power. He has received the person of power. Acts chapter number 1 verse 8, and you shall receive power, you shall take off power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Before then in John, he's breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Ghost. So there is the receiving of the Holy Ghost, there is the receiving of power. So Holy Ghost is a source of power, but it is prayer that makes power what? Available. I take up power from my source by prayer. So my source of power is the Holy Spirit, but I don't have power for use until I have prayed and lay out or receive power from the Holy Ghost. Did you get that? So, believers, we, our work of power is not the same. We only have the same source of power. We don't have the same work of power. We only have the same source of power. We don't have the same work of power. So that thing you do and say, ah, I have the Holy Ghost, I am as powerful as God. You deceive thyself. Are you following me? When the Bible says they took up power, Acts chapter number one, he said you will receive power. He said this is what will happen when you stay in what I call praying. The Bible said they stay in what I call praying for days and they took up power of the Holy Ghost. So the reason the believer is in that, in the use of power, is not because he doesn't have the source of power, but because he has not made power, what? Available. So Ephesians says, I will do exceedingly abundantly above what you can ask or what? Or think according to the power that is at work in you. Not the power that is resident in you. The power resident in me is the person of the Holy Ghost. The power to work in me is one I've made available in the place of prayer. So you can do the things I do, except that we don't have the same power storage. Are you getting that? So he says, this is what will happen to you when you pray. He says, you make power available. I make power available. You know, the sad thing is that what this generation call power, what this generation call power, is the work of power that they used to usher and serve tables in the Bible days. Funny enough, what many of us call power is not even up to that. Because go and check out the qualification of, D, of Dickens. Go and check out the, the, the qualification of ushers in the Bible. Go and look at Stephen. He was not a man of God. He was just an usher. And I'm not sure it was the HOD. So what we celebrate as power today could not pass, you, 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 it was too low to serve tables. And that was why when they served tables and they had the communion, they were healed. Because the woman that carried you to the table, power was gushing out of her fingers. That was the difference. Not that the person that was carrying the table said, her hands contaminated, it's only the blood that washed it. So the power in that hand was the, not no power, it's just that the hand is clean by the blood. And one are the seven is to one another. No power flow. You just know that it's clean by the blood. Without the blood, the communion will even be contaminated. So what we celebrate today as power, nah, was not up to what they use in seven tables. Because you come back and say, ah, I have received power. The Holy Ghost has come upon me. Show us. Show us. Show us. So if the believer would take God's healing power to his neighbor, to the nations of the earth, he must host the power of God at a dimension that will make his generation bow. And the secret to it is tremendous power 
being available. And you know how tremendous power is made available? It is through continued heartfelt prayer. It is not just through prayer. Prayer must be what? Continued. It must be heartfelt. Prayer must be what? Shout it. It must be what? It must be what? Continued. It must be heartfelt. So I want to agree that Abraham had a prayer life. He had a prayer life. He had a continued prayer life. He had an heartfelt prayer life. So power was available for use. You know, he didn't plan it. He didn't say, I'll like, uh, yeah, you want babies, eh? Okay, give me three days. There was never a time in the Bible where men first went away and said, give me some days to minister. They said it for the prophetic because they might need to search the heart of God. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. They might need to search the heart of God. They said it for the prophetic. For prophetic instruction, give me some days. Let me go and pray. The Lord will speak to me. But never, never for healing power. You know why? It means those men God used, they had a lifestyle of continued, heartfelt prayer. So they could make it available. At any time it is needed. So let's stop celebrating nonsense. The only healing you celebrate is back pain. Headache. No. 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 What paracetamol can solve? So it means if that is the case, how much is parasama? 100 naira. It means your anointing is equivalent to 100 naira. One of my sons came to me. He's like, my, my son. He's growing. He's his son. He said, Papa, I went for evangelism. I healed people. Two people, they have a headache and they heal them. I said, No, you shouldn't have healed them. You should have given them parasama. Bethany is laughing now. Instead of him to be crying, he's still laughing. He said, why did you give them paracetamol? I don't put it for you. You say you have a headache. headache. I said, go and take paracetamol. That cannot be the use of my power. My power is so, it's so premium to be using on headache. It's the truth. Headache. The only time I heal headache, you tell me the headache has been there for 10 years. You are taking paracetamol? I healed, I healed someone's mother. God's power. Did your mom tell you? If the mother had been having it for like 35 years, you know that headache is not a headache. It's from the pit of hell. 35 years. And I hear that from four, five months ago now. Four months, three, four, four months ago. I said, headache, leave. They came back this week. I said, I said, as the headache come back? I said, no. I said, can never come back. That is when I use my anointing for headache. Put a value on your anointing. <laughs> Praise God. Say, I put a value on my anointing. It's more than 100 naira. If you're watching me abroad, I'm talking about like 25 cent. So bad, right? I put a premium on it. And how do I do that? I stay in heartfelt and continued prayer. I won't stop until... Until this generation feels this thing in my hand. This power in my hand. No, no, your hand is you're shaking, it's vibrating. It doesn't mean there's power there. It means there can be power there. Yeah. Did you hear me? It doesn't mean there's power there either. But it means that this hand should not be used for air by alone. The power should be flowing through it. Redirect the use. Redirect the use. That's what they say. But how do I make that happen? Through continued, heartfelt prayer. Stand to your feet. Get angry. Hallelujah. 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 Get angry. I leave it to the God of your salvation. 
Ikato Sahadina. Not anymore. Say not anymore. I akari shaha. My anointing pass hundred naira. It pass five hundred naira. It pass one thousand naira. <laughs> Come on, release words now. Kariba and Abaya. These hands will heal the sick. Leladas zoda den ne ride dina ko zena kadiga. Yena anda di shahaya bada desha na banda bida dada dida dada dosha. Ride ko zeni ni ni gosha. Ride kiga gosha ta haya kadira. Oh zaka gaga gaga na branda ko zudu dusha. Alla ko se de gede redesha. Jesus ja. By the revelation of that song, you should not be bound by sickness or disease. We should not be bound. Say to yourself, everything that has held me bound. Sickness, disease, demonic activity, whatever name it is called. Everything that has held me bound. In the name of Jesus. Lose your hold. Lose your hold, lose your hold in the name of Jesus. Everything that has held me bound in the name of Jesus, lose your hold now. Now, listen, don't joke with seasons like this. He said, I have not called the house of Jacob to seek me in vain. So, you don't come to God's house in vain, but you determine how much you take. If you like those of praying. If you like, don't open your mouth. I will go back home, I will eat, and I will sleep. Hear me carefully. I began to wonder how come that a servant was barren because his master was barren. It means that curses flows in the environment. You can carry the curse of your boss. Curses flow in environment. It flows in territories. It flows in families. Now, that is experience. But there is a legal truth that says I've been freed from whatever curse. Are you following me? Now, you don't go around saying, I am free from curse. When there is an example, or when you are an example of a curse life. You don't go around saying, I'm free. I, can't you see the word says, I'm free? No, 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 that's not what it means. The purpose of revelation is for you to enter. Are you following me? So you are going to deal with every experience that contradicts the legal truth that you are free. Are you following me? You are going to deal with every experience that contradicts the written word, that contradicts the legal truth that says I'm free. Are you ready? Every curse operating in territories, in family, in workplace, in relationship, finding expression in my life. In the name of Jesus. I enforce what has been done on the cross. I'm free in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I enforce what has been done on the cross. And I decree, I am free. Yeah, 
Zabadadash. 